everybody as you uh come in and and um, you know join us on this webinar we just wanted to say thank you very much for joining us today and, and uh if you can put in the chat box your name and where you're from we'd love to hear from you uh, we'll give it uh, like another two minutes uh, let more people log on and then we'll get started we have a great lineup today so wonderful we have now 23 people on the webinar so far um, people are still coming in please put in the chat box box your name and where you're from we'd love to hear from each of you as you log in just climbing so as you come on um, maybe we can run the first uh, poll we have a poll as you uh, join the webinar today that we'd like you to answer margaret could you run the first poll there you go please give us your name where you're from and answer the poll question do you think the information shared above about covid so far is leading to behavior change? That's the opening question as you, um, as you log in this morning. Okay, I see a few people saying good morning. Happy to be part of the discussion. Hi, Mira, nice to see you. Please answer the poll question as you uh, get settled. We have a great lineup today talking about communication and misinformation. Ivy, thank you. Good to see you this today. James, wonderful to see you. Great, we have uh, 32 and climbing. We'll give it a few more minutes. Please answer the poll question. Um, do you think the information shared about COVID-19 so far is leading to behavior change? Yes or no? Somebody from South Africa, Zwane, Lara, let us know where you're from as you uh, log on, please. Okay, give it a few more seconds. Medi we have a medical doctor from Pakistan. Wonderful, welcome to the webinar. Today's webinar is on communication and misinformation during the COVID-19 pandemic. We wanna know if you think the information that's being shared so far is leading to behavior change. Good morning, everybody. Okay, I think we can uh, look at the poll result results so far. Margaret, can you show us the poll results? Okay, ah, that's interesting. I would have said, I would have thought no was, uh, was going to come out on top, but you, as you can see, 55% of those who've uh, joined us think that yes, we are seeing behavior change. That's great. Okay, as more people log on, you can take that uh, down now. Um, as more people log on, I just want to welcome you to AVPA and Sankalp Dialogue uh, webinar series. This is actually number seven out of um, our series on misinformation and communication during COVID-19. We have a great lineup of speakers today. We're very excited to uh, host this. Uh, webinar and uh, to start us off I'm going to introduce our CEO uh, Dr. Frank Aswani he's the CEO of AVPA Frank over to you thank you Nancy and uh, welcome everyone and thank you and welcome especially to our speakers today Pat uh, who's a board member in Nigeria Tandy uh, really excited to have you and Osman thank you so much for making time to join us 
This is the seventh in this series of uh, webinars jointly hosted by uh, SANCAP and ADPA, looking at um, especially issues relating to the COVID crisis and particularly how they affect um, the most vulnerable in our communities, looking at the people in former settlements, rural areas, and other uh, types of vulnerable communities on the continent. Uh, we deliberately uh, structured these um, webinars to bring together a Pan-African uh, range of speakers so we can share lessons learned across multiple countries. And the whole objective is so we can learn from each other. We have very similar problems across the continent and this is um, a great opportunity for us to share how we're managing um, to work through the crisis. So uh, I wanted to just welcome everyone and uh, let's stay engaged, let's keep informed. Uh, you've seen the Twitter handle, you've seen the um, uh, th there's a lot more chats, chats that we, we can share. Please keep busy in the chats, um, keep engaged, ask questions, and we are looking forward to a fantastic webinar. Thank you, Nancy, back to you. Thank you, Frank. Um, so before we start, I just want to um, welcome everybody again, and please, um, as we move through the webinar today, uh, through our, our speakers' presentations, Use the chat box to um, make comments or send uh, questions. We will have a Q&A at the end of the session today. And uh, we'll also have a very short open mic um, segment so that anybody who has uh, comments or further questions can, can speak. Uh, in terms of timing, we usually keep this at exactly one hour. But if people are willing to go over by about 10, 15 minutes, that's fine. All our speakers have said they can stick around. So great. Um, without further ado, I want to introduce our first speaker from South Africa, Thandi. Uh, Thandi works with uh, mining communities and in areas where there's very little or no internet connection. So you can imagine the challenge that uh, she has had in making sure that the message about COVID-19 um, is spread in those areas. Sandy, oh. you want to turn off your uh, turn on your mic and you. I'm on. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining. Um, as per Nancy's introduction, I am going to talk about the one particular mining community in Pilansburg. So to give you context, the community that I'm talking about is, has approximately 160,000 people who are scattered around nine villages. And unlike... Um, here in Johannesburg, where there's a township, this is in the, the literal sense, a village. Um, one of the things I mentioned, Nancy, is the lack of um, reception day, right? But the, my other challenge in communicating, especially with this particular group, is the different age groups. So we have a majority of the residents who are the elderly, like the minimum age is 75, and then the other group is very small kids, like as you can see that little boy on my slide, right? So the person that we would need to help um, communicate or bridge the gap between the, the grandma and the little boy is sitting in the seat is working. So that was our first challenge. Then the second challenge was the reception area and the data cost because of their socioeconomic situation. Um, that, uh, is a challenge. So anything that we do has to be practical. It has to be in written form or the radio. The good thing is that we do, we do have a local radio station that um, we looked at partnering with, right? So um, when we were looking at, when, so when the pandemic became a reality, and I think like everybody else, we were inundated with information. We started seeing it coming from Wuhan and then it was in Europe, and then all of a sudden it was on our doorstep. And in response to it, I remember it was like a few days when the president started talking to us about it, we as a team launched what we call the PPM COVID-19 relief program. And part of this program was to help calm the panic. So we had a few stakeholders that we had to bear in mind. We also knew that um, from our personal experiences that we were receiving 
so much information and it was causing such a panic that whatever we were doing, we had to share the information, but we needed to also make sure that we were calming people. And we were calming people on information that we also didn't know. You know, I think the information, we were getting the information as and when it was coming. So there wasn't any real planning that, okay, we know what this thing is. This way, today we were told, okay, it's a virus, it spreads this way. And then they have to get that information and transmit it to everyone else. Then the lockdown was called in, and half of us, well, all of us, the mind was shut down and everyone went home, which caused a second layer of panic. Now people worried about losing their job. For us, though, we saw that as an opportunity for us to disseminate information. So before the lockdown, we created a COVID-19 special edition newsletter. And this was for the employees so that people would know what this uh, virus was, how it was impacting everyone, and what the possible uh, ways to stop the spread. Um, First thing, and another thing is that we printed this copy. Normally we give it to them electronically, but to make sure that we brought it to the community, we printed it. And another thing that I forgot to mention is that uh, the mine employs 80% of the community, of the, like our employees make up 80% of that community. So sharing that, oh, okay. Can you hear me? So sharing that information. Yeah, if you keep closer to the mic. Okay, yes, cool, I'm coming better. close. Yeah, yes. better. All right. So we spoke, we, we had to find trusted sources. So the, you know, one of the things we spoke about was the misinformation. So there was a lot of people who were sharing information on what was happening, what this virus was. And to try curb that, we used the people that they trusted to share this information with, which were our employees. So every morning, we would send a, a, a note. The status of the virus, its impact, and what it means. Right? Then we started um, with our CEO, we started um, speaking to them um, more regularly. So on a Sunday, when they, now the lockdown is a day, on a Sunday, we would send the message. You know when you're getting ready, because everybody was on lockdown, on Sunday morning, you're getting ready, you're preparing yourself mentally to go back to work, and now you can't, right? So that Sunday evening, our CEO would send them a message to say, you are anxious, you still have your job, don't worry. And when you are feeling anxious, these are a few things that you need to do to calm down. During the week, we would speak to them again, just to reassure them that, listen, everything is still okay. We still find there is a plan in, 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 in curbing this, this virus. And then on the weekend, we send them little tips on what to do while you are staying at home. The second point is the slide that you were looking at. Um, Again, if you see everything that we were getting about the virus was regulatory, was health um, related, but it wasn't, it wasn't something that was easily translatable. So somebody says to you, um, keep your social distancing by keeping a one meter distance between you and this next person. And what is one meter? You know, we don't walk around like we had to literally do this to our arms and show people that's how long one meter is. We then also, um, like if you look at the screen that's on now, when people say wash your hands, we were speaking about washing your hands for 20 seconds, but when? So we then get the most practical, um, this, this little poster where we were putting it up, or wash your hands and under all these circumstances, and it started being relatable. Um, we also started a community newspaper because that was another thing. They, don't, they have the radio station, but they didn't have a community newspaper created a community paper and put this information in there. We, we spoke about, um, play, um, and then we took it to places where we were going. You know, in the suburbs, we were told that it was easy to be under lockdown. It was, you know, mentally challenging, but it was easier to confine us into one place. We knew these people still had to go to tax shops, to take savings, and, and, and. So we started um, putting it, putting those things on, on at the tax events and stuff. The one, Learning when I'm about to wrap up is if you look at the next slide, right? Um, the one thing that we knew is that we had to get people that they trusted. We used our employees to make it mitigate against the fake news. We then started putting these newspapers, if you can see all around, we started putting these newspapers at places where they were frequenting. Um, if I, one of the things that you were, were asking me is, 
what would I have done differently with this campaign? I think the one thing is I would have leveraged the community radio station more. As much as they had this, uh, this newspapers and stuff, it was, one, it was a monthly paper. So I, we had three copies to date. We've done three copies. But with the radio station, I think there would have been a little bit more frequency and it would have been uh, able to talk to them a lot more. Which then brings me to my last point about when you asked about the changing of behavior. I think now that we've started, we've created a place, right? We've given them the information and stuff. What we have here in suburbs is the tools to show us what social distancing is. When you get to a, a, um, a supermarket, there are speakers on the floor to show you, okay, this is what a meter is. We have masks around like saying, listen, you can't walk in here without a mask. We don't have that in townships, right? Um, we're missing, and I think if we want, we need to give them the tools. Start showing people what um, social distancing is, what this behavior is, what wearing masks are. And that's when we're going to start, I believe that we're going to start changing the behavior. And that's my story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sande. That was uh, really uh, great information. I, in particular, I liked that slide where, um, I think it was the second slide where it showed how, how when exactly do you wash your hands? Actually, I, I don't think I've seen that kind of communication in Kenya, and I think it's so important because people don't realize that, you know, after you touch a surface or door handle, yeah, that slide. I, I think that's uh, brilliant. Um, so we'll move on to the next uh, speaker, Osman. Um, Osman uh, works for an organization called Arifu and has been uh, doing a lot of work around um, providing the accurate information uh, through cell phones about COVID-19. So over to you, Osman. Uh, thank you, Nancy. Can you just check if you can hear me quickly? It seems like you can. Yep, we can hear you. Perfect. So uh, we can thank hear you, you, Nancy. you. Great. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for that introduction. Uh, very excited to have the opportunity to be here and share what uh, Arifu's COVID-19 response strategy is and a little bit about the how and a little bit about the why. Also keen to learn from the collective wisdom of Tandi and Professor Otomi, uh, ABP and uh, attendees here. As uh, Nancy has already mentioned, I'm Usman, I'm the head of research at Arifu. Uh, Arifu is a smart personal learning assistant and content marketplace. We exist to increase knowledge and uh, hopefully by doing so, increase, uh, change behavior for, uh, in positive directions. We currently operate in several geographic locations, uh, including Uganda, Kenya, Nigeria, Zambia, Tanzania, and Rwanda. Uh, to date, we have over 1.2 million learners and they're growing month by month. Uh, the learners comprise of farmers, youth, merchants, urban, rural households. As such, we're sector and geography agnostic. So while Tanzania spoke to a very specific population, we'll be speaking a little bit broader. And the, the focus right now for us is to create and deploy relevant, credible, accessible content to inform decision-making day to day. So what I'll speak a bit about today is about the what and a bit about the how of Arifu's uh, COVID programs. And uh, I would love any questions that arise from this presentation to unpack the why further. The tougher the questions, the better. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Arifu operates through partnerships. Um, these partnerships across, uh, exist across the public and private sector and really uh, drive Arifu's impact and articulate our value proposition. So beyond aligning on joint objectives with uh, partners, we start the design process of any information strategy or an information dissemination strategy by learning what the problem is for end users uh, by, you know, surprise, speaking to them. So what do we try to answer by speaking to end users? Next slide, please. So the, what we try to answer by speaking to end users is to inform sort of these broad four pillars that define our content design and deployment process. So while a lot needs to be unpacked within these four pillars, I'll largely focus on credibility because uh, as also Tandi mentioned, um, the misinformation uh, is rife and it exists in many different ways. It exists in not being comprehensible. It exists in being fake. It exists in the fact that information has changed over time. And so that creates its own anxieties. Um, Happy uh, to also share more about the evidence base or that drive these principles uh, that is both global as well as our own. Uh, and that can be shared if, if that's not. 
Um, so, you know, what drives our credibility? I mean, at least from what we've seen through the research that we've conducted, there's quite a few dimensions to this. So one is that we try to always emphasize or present ourselves as a third party information service um, because that's what we are. And we're not a marketing effort. We use storytelling through a chatbot, a chatbot that has a name. It's called Arifu. Um, we partner to amplify efforts of organizations that already have tight knit relationships with end users. That also bridges that trust issue that you might as, that might uh, arise from a random text message that arises or SMS or whatever it might be, or sorry, a WhatsApp message or whatever. So the content has to be reliable uh, as well. So when we do this, what we're conveying needs to be reliable. And reliability is a, is a tough concept to unpack because it's not just about being correct, it's about being applicable. So happy to further unpack this in the Q&A as well. Um, but these are the sort of the broad design principles we apply in our approach. Uh, next slide, please. So under COVID-19, we pretty early on realized that it was not it was never going to be just a health information issue. We saw that many countries were locking down, others were adapting in different ways uh, without locking down. Uh, certainly we saw examples early on from China and South Korea as a sort of guiding, a guiding information pieces for us to inform our strategy. Uh, and so, you know, when we think about uh, what we wanna do in terms of a response, we need to figure out what we wanna convey and what is really happening. Uh, for uh, end users or end learners or citizens of particular countries. So you have to recognize with information, whether fake or too much or not comprehensible, uh, comes uncertainty. And with uncertainty comes anxiety. And that anxiety sometimes can hamper decision making, uh, prohibit it or directionally make it directionally incorrect. Let's put it that way. And so, you know, many things arose from our conversations with end users from our platform. Uh, many things around business uh, concerns, certainly about health information needs. Uh, anxieties around how people were seeing each other as part of a community, uh, whatever community they might be in. Um, a significant portion of our insights were derived from informal settlements, but not exclusively. Um, and so what we had to figure out is like, what were the most urgent questions that needed answered? Um, and something that really popped up were certainly on business challenges. Like, you know, we didn't think about this first, but we realized from these conversations that just by having a curfew at 7 p.m., shops that depended on post-work traffic uh, immediately saw a loss in demand, for example, right? And that's a pretty big thing to keep in mind uh, when you're talking about any kind of population that is uh, operating an SME, for example. So understanding that is important, and so solutions then have to cater to those problems. This informed our broad strategy. So uh, that's articulated in the next slide. So the way we applied um, this information is sort of in a two-pronged way. Um, one was our COVID-19, what we've called the starter pack. It's free to license and it's free to use for organizations. But the way this, this particular starter pack operates is that it focuses heavily on the most urgent questions that seem to be arising uh, among populations. And it speaks to the dimensions of health information, including do-it-yourselves around how to make a mask, how to use, build, make sanitizer. Uh, information on livelihoods, different practices, businesses, particularly SMEs, can uh, adopt to uh, that were informed by our partners who are working directly with these SMEs in informal settlements and otherwise. Uh, financial planning, digital finance in particular, uh, how that can be used uh, in, in uh, certainly in minimizing exposure to different uh, materials, especially cash. And of course, you know, like we talked about community building content, like what do you do now that you're maybe stuck at home or prohibited from being outside at a certain time, point in time, uh, given that that in itself causes its own stresses and anxieties and certainly other issues that are pretty um, obvious to most here. So the second prong was about specific. So there are concerns that arise, say, for pregnant, pregnant women that are not specifically spoken about in the general social distancing and wash your hands sort of messaging strategy, right? So what are the concerns that pregnant women have? Now, uh, so one of the conversations we started having was with an organization that focuses exclusively on reproductive health and seeing the questions they're getting. Um, so that's important to sort of emphasize here, um, that the specific also needs to be done to contextualize to the questions that people have. Next slide, please. Um, so this is just a snapshot of what it looks like uh, in the end. Um, and this is not all the content, nor is this uh, the full content stream for this particular health information packet, but it speaks to how the content flows, certain design principles that were in action, both for text versions uh, as well as rich media. Um, it's, it hopefully illustrates how the information is meant to be relatable by speaking to who the, the, the health worker is, 
uh, speaking to what is in the individual's control, preempting concerns, and also mentioning which partner we've been working with so that if they have that direct relationship, like there's an associated trust that comes from that. And hopefully amplifies the credibility of the content. Uh, next slide, please. Um, to expand this effort and build into our future plans, we're looking broadly for four things, but primarily for two. So partnerships with high impact and reach organizations with deep knowledge of their audiences, uh, particularly around financial services that, that support SMEs and farmers uh, would be essential. Uh, this could be within Kenya, it could be outside Kenya. We are, as I mentioned, we are operating in multiple countries right now and can launch at least using WhatsApp pretty quickly in different arenas and different uh, spaces and sectors. Um, and certainly that also helps us expand our content library because uh, especially for different learner populations, as I mentioned, uh, I gave an example about before, it's not just about even taking the general and making it consumable, it's getting into the specific concerns that different populations have. Um, and of course, you know, we need to have research funding because like uh, ultimately this is a trial and error uh, and it is about articulating what's working so that other institutions and organizations can learn from our efforts and of course so can we and uh, essentially future-proof our program so that, you know, Arifu's model was right fit for a COVID response, in my view. Um, but certainly there's plenty to be understood about what will emerge from this and how do we prepare for that. Uh, so I'll stop there. I spoke fast to stick with my eight minute time slot. Uh, hopefully Nancy's proud of me and uh, I'll, I'll leave, it, leave it over there. Thank you so much. Wonderful, Osman. You really did. I, I can tell that you must have timed yourself yourself a few times. Thank you. Wonderful presentation. In particularly, in particular, I think what I liked was the fact that you're um, really seeking partnerships to to you know to run with this. Uh, Mastercard, in particular, I saw, and uh, Penda Health, which I think that's another thing we we really need to understand how important uh, important is to collaborate around um, this whole issue of uh, communication and misinformation. Some interesting questions coming in. Uh, we'll save them for the end for Osman and Sande. Uh, I think now we go on to the next, um, Margaret, if you can show us the next uh, poll. Before we move on to Pat, uh, could you put up the next poll, please? Great. So we'd like you to answer this poll. Um, what do you think is the best way to ensure that we share the right information on COVID-19 targeting people in informal settlements, particularly in informal settlements? Um, I just saw somebody comment that um, they feel a lot of the misinformation is uh, from elderly people sharing uh, WhatsApp messages. Um, <laughs> So it, it, it's interesting to, to, to know that, um, yeah, I think people are, are concerned about all the misinformation, but we'd like to know what's the best way to ensure that we're sending out the right information. Uh, please answer that poll, we'll keep it up for another second and then we'll move to the, our next uh, speaker. Um, I think, uh, Please put, I can see a few questions coming in for Osman. Um, please feel free to put more questions in the chat box for Osman and Sandy uh, before we move on to the next speaker. Great, Margaret, can we see uh, the re results for this poll? Let's see what people are thinking and saying. Okay. Only allow fact-checked information on COVID-19 to be made available to the public. That's 44%. And then uh, at 37%, allow volunteers, community-based organizations to disseminate information along with sanitizers and masks. Great points. Yep, I, I think that's uh, really great information. Uh, nobody picked gov gov governments to... <laughs> to disseminate, <laughs> only governments to disseminate COVID-19 information. <laughs> That's interesting. All right, thank you, Margaret. You can put down the, um, you can put down the poll now. Um, I'd like to now introduce our next speaker, who is Professor Patrick Utomi from Nigeria. Um, as Frank had mentioned at the beginning, uh, Professor Utomi is also, sits on the 
uh, Nigeria Board of, or AVPA. Um, and he is a professor of economics at the Lagos School of Business. Over to you, Pat. Thank you. Well, thank you so very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to join here. I'd like to go very uh, quickly to the heart of the matter. And it's got to do with trust and communication and how you are effective in communicating. Um, as soon as the uh, pandemic broke or we became sensitive to it uh, in these parts, one of the early things to happen is that people jump on the bandwagon. Uh, in Nigeria, we have a very activist uh, central bank, which quickly tried to put together some private sector players. And I was struck the first day that this coalition got together and comments I heard from people around that we were about to miss the most important point in communication, which is the transfer of meaning from a certain person or group of persons to the other effectively. Because many times when there is an effort to transfer meaning, people assume or take it for granted that meaning is exactly as intended. Most times, actually, it doesn't quite that way because there is what was the noise that immediately felt uh, was coming up here. The first noise was noise coming from credibility. Credibility in the sense that um, we, most of us in Africa, live in a fairly low trust environment, low trust for government. I mean, if you look at one end, at high trust for government, say Denmark, you know, many African countries, Nigeria certainly has a very, very, very low trust kind of environment. And so once these top big private sector players, indigenous private sector players, clustered around government agencies, the general perception was, aha, the rent seekers and government are conniving again to take advantage of the people. And I thought the best thing to do was to build a more credible path. And we tried to therefore move to building a civil society coalition with some private sector. So CVL working with AVPA, American Business Council and others tried to put this coalition very quickly together. So if we have this coalition that is about to at least put provide an alternative. How best were we to uh, go forward? And please, next slide, with, with uh, communicating um, to various uh, segments of, of the population. Well, I thought that um, we had to, in my manner of speaking, segment the, the population and who and who we're trying to reach. Uh, what struck me immediately was the ultra poor how do you build credibility with the ultra poor? You know, many years ago, I spent a, a, a couple of weeks with in Oh dear, we're losing you, Pat. We are communicating to in this uh, different world. Listen to me. Uh, now, now it's better. Okay. Come back. Can you hear me now? Pat, it might be helpful if you just turn oh. off your video. It might just conserve some. Anyway. Yeah, maybe turn off your video. We, Okay, try again. Uh, uh, um, uh, oh dear, we can't hear you. Try again. It's cutting. I think it must be your...
Uh, no, not really. Just say something again. Let's see. Otherwise, we may have to wait a um, while. The, 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 yeah. There seems to be. You can't hear me. This is really seems sad. Like, uh, uh, maybe the connection, your internet connection. There, there. Now, now you're back. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm back now. Okay. Maybe, uh, Pat, if is, you could um, repeat maybe the, the last 60 seconds of what you were trying to say, because I think we, we missed uh, quite, quite a bit of it. I think that would be really helpful. So now it seems like we can hear All you. right. Yeah, we can hear you. All right. Question. Okay, great. I, I said that we began to try to look at the uh, various segments of the population and what uh, were their key motivations and therefore how to build trust and be effective in communicating to these segments of the population. And I recall that I had had experience spending a couple of weeks at BRAC in Bangladesh about 10 or more years ago when I, I, yeah, I got interested in what uh, 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 they were doing. And I found that they had to study very closely the ultra poor and therefore how best to support them. And you didn't do what you did with the ultra poor for the middle, the you know, not so poor, poor, and so on and so forth. So we try to apply those kinds of ideas in segmenting the uh, population and looking for people who were more credible with each population group and what challenged each group more. We found that with the ultra poor, they were so hungry that it was important to um, provide them some means of sustenance to get them to even listen. Now, government and the big coalition had tried to do that, but had generated, in many cases, the opposite. People complained that the so-called palliatives, as we call them in Nigeria, were going to party people, going to people who government officials were abusing this. And so we tried to work a system that allowed us to generate a number, uh, quite a bit of um, resource in terms of food that we would distribute to the ultra poor. But as we do it, it's not just come and take food and we give them significantly more quantity than they were getting from the government agencies and the bigger uh, uh, coalitions. Then we spoke to them about how to behave in these times. Then amongst the package we gave them were masks, were sanitizers, were soap. Uh, so it, it was easy to connect to that population group. And we tried to then use uh, skits, um, uh, um, animated uh, 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 presentations to communicate through social media to young people, to women. Uh, we had a large poor widow group that we tried to, to reach also. I mean, to understand the approach that we took is to understand the Center for Values in Leadership, which was leading this coalition. Uh, I started this uh, uh, center oh, some, in 2004. I'd had a, a career that took me to industry. I was CEO of a major multinational company. Then I had served in government at a presidential advisory level. Then I returned to academia. And I, it was clear to me that the biggest challenge we had was leadership. How do you build leaders who can have empathy and connect to solve society's problems? That's how CVL was founded. So we thought that we should provide some leadership in this segmentation of the market and using people that were credible with the various population groups to communicate to them. Uh, I thought that we were making uh, quite a bit of progress. We also tried to find out how best practice. For example, when we saw that Taiwan did a great job of containing COVID-19, I set up a meeting with the ambassador of Taiwan, the trade uh, ambassador of Taiwan in Nigeria. We met with him, spent time talking about what happened in Taiwan, and what we could learn from them. And we tried to design communication to encourage uh, all of this. Um, so what's the point uh, that has what's been learned from this effort and what we do uh, to be uh, more uh, effective. Uh, the major lesson I think that we have, have learned, one minute. if you just move to the next slide, is that, uh, sure, okay. okay. Um, the, I'm even more sensitive now to the post-COVID 
era. Uh, experience shows that there is a kind of post-trauma syndrome that goes with this kind of experience. Uh, how do we communicate to people to better adjust for a time after the pandemic? Give a quick example in closing. Uh, there is um, a, a lot of literature on what happened dur during the um, Spanish influenza 1919. A city like San Francisco is a good example where people were resistant to communication on uh, uh, behavior. And then the second wave came and a lot of people died in San Francisco. For three years after the end of the pandemic, people were unwilling to go to public gatherings and all of that. That is going to be the biggest challenge we'll face. How do we prepare people uh, not to suffer post-trauma syndrome from going through the pandemic? And this is the kind of communication that we are designing now and trying uh, to put out. I think I'll stop there. Thank, thank you so much, Pat. That was uh, very enlightening. Um, and I, in particular, I liked um, how you started off about the issues about trust. And um, I could probably kick off the first question actually to you, Pat. We'll start our Q&A. Um, is basically who do the ultra poor trust the most? What have you uh, found out about, you know, about that in particular? Who, who do we go through to address um, issues when it comes to the ultra poor. Um, while Pat is answering that question, could please could people please put their questions for Sandy, Osman, and Pat in the chat box, and we will um, move to question and answer now. Pat. Yeah, yeah. Well, what we found is that in many communities, the ultra poor are usually very welcoming of members of the community who have done well, who come back to support them in different ways. They become community leaders. So to reach that group, uh, you know, uh, engaging those community leaders, not just out of your title, but community leaders who regularly ask after them, do things in the community for them, they are very, very trusting of those kinds of people. Then, of course, there are traditional elders and community uh, leaders. But NGOs that also come in there and have real impact are powerful. And this is why I think it is important for NGOs to seek synergy, look at people who work in different communities. One of the things we tried to do was to get the Ford Foundation, which was part of our coalition, to give us names of the NGOs that have operated in those communities in the past because they have built up some credibility and working through them you can be a lot more effective I think. So yeah so basically people who have lived in the community who have worked with uh, different communities basically your neighbors people you you trust are, are the people yeah. you've, you've seen the most. Uh, I'm sure also churches religious leaders um, those are also very important yeah. channels to use. Um, Nancy, I have a Nancy, question I mean, for Sandy okay. and yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, if I may just add, we, we tried to create uh, um, you know, what we called, um, well, neighbors caring for neighbors. Uh, in geographies, we tried to identify upscale communities. You know, you can go into a, an area. You have an upscale community, you have uh, an industrial estate, and then you have very poor, poor people living in some transition community. Yes. So we call them human solidarity networks. Uh, neighbors carry together, and the more favored will work up programs that address the challenges of the poorest of the poor. Uh, yeah. uh, effectiveness. I think uh, uh, sometimes I want to see if we can develop those into standing organizations of neighbors caring for neighbors, human solidarity networks in geographies. I think this is a major learning from this and to go out of this uh, pandemic with these are standing uh, uh, bodies. Yeah. 
Wonderful idea. Great. Um, let's move on. And, and in fact, uh, one thing that I'd like to remind everybody is um, that we are open to staying on for another 10, 15 minutes past the hour. If uh, our speakers have all agreed um, that if you have more questions or comments, we can stay on a little bit uh, longer for today's webinar. Um, I'd also like um, all those who are on the webinar to start putting in the chat box their questions for uh, our speakers and topics that they'd like to hear about um, for our next uh, series of webinars. Topics and uh, uh, speakers that you'd like to hear from, we'd love your ideas. So the next question is for Thandi. Um, uh, somebody wants to know um, whether were you not worried that uh, COVID-19 would be transmitted via the newspaper copy, copies that you were uh, handing out? In fact, that's always been my question. I, I still order newspapers in, in my household, <laughs> and I always wonder, should I, be, should I continue to order them? And uh, the other question was, were the, were the messages um, in, in the local uh, language or mm -hmm. in English? Over to you, Thandi. Thanks, Lucy. You know, when we started, and I think like Professor mm -hmm. um, Chobi was saying, this has been as we you go, you know, we've been learning as we go. The first thing when we were distributing this newspapers, it was to get information to the people. Uh, we were more concerned about actually the fact that we're breaking the law because not everybody was supposed to be under lockdown. So us going around and handing out these newspapers, we were contravening the lockdown rules. So that was our biggest problem. I actually, now I haven't even, before this question, I'd not even thought about it. It wasn't even a, an issue for us, right? So no, we were, we were not concerned about that. And now that we know better, I think we'll find other ways of distributing this copy. Okay. Um, sorry, what was the second are, question? Are we even oh, the sure language. whether, yeah, the language. Which? The language, okay. So I think oh, I didn't get the chance to mention it. And I was saying one of my regrets was that the copy wasn't translated in the local language. I sh we, sh we should have done that. Uh, this in response also yeah. to the older communities. I remember I showed you that the, there was quite a large older community of uh, grandmas and grandpas, and I wasn't sure if they understood what was in there, right? And even the small kids, like there's that little boy, that cute little boy holding the paper, I'm not sure if they understood the information that was in there, you know? So I think the next round, in taking all lessons now, in the next round, we're going to try two copies, one in the local language and one in the continuated English. Great, thank you. Uh, my next question is for Osman. Um, somebody wants to know, how do you measure um, reach and behavior change um, through our, our Arifu? Well, thanks for that question. Yeah, it's, it's a really good one. Um, I'll try to be concise here because there's many different ways we do that. So reach is the easy one. I mean, that's the vanity statistic any organization has. Like, this is the number of people who have ever touched our service, right? But what we do care about is, does that reach translate into something meaningful for end users? So, so broadly, our theory of change uh, is predicated on a couple of things. One is that this information that is being dispatched, it, met, it in the design process, it needs to be thinking about answering these questions. This is what I spoke to in the, in the presentation as well that does it answer questions that people already have? So there's a, there's a component of understanding the need and demand here. So what is the need and what is the demand and how do we bridge those two things? But beyond that, I mean, there's multiple methodologies we employ. I mean, we certainly, on an ongoing basis, we have rapid A-B tests. There's a battery of them we're designing right now. There's about a thousand variations we're looking at across different projects um, to measure different levels of engagement. So just, that's, just, that's just a thin measure of behavior change. Are people looking at the content? Within that content, we have a bunch of quiz scores, quizzes that measure different levels of learning. Of course, it's an approximation of that. Um, each quiz question has different levels of complexity with it, which has different weights, which calculates something called a knowledge or skill score, as we call it. 
Um, we've also seen that that knowledge and skills score is actually in a preliminary study quite predictive of things like income, things like some aspects of behavior change. It's quite interesting for us to explore further. Um, Beyond that, I certainly we employ different methodologies from the econometrics, epidemiological, and also deep clinical science to try to understand what's really going on in terms of behavior change, right? So that involves everything from randomized control trials, difference in difference models, regression discontinuity designs, uh, multivariate regressions. I could really go on. <laughs> There's quite a lot going on at Arif Winters of Research. So please, uh, if anyone wants to unpack that further, you can reach out directly to me uh, or anyone on our team. Um, certainly, I would love to engage in that. That's my bread and butter. So, okay, great, thank you. Um, this next question is for anybody who'd like to answer it. Um, further, with uh, to the rapid changing face of this pandemic uh, and how it spreads and how to prevent it, etc. Um, who do you feel is responsible for ensuring the information that is reaching uh, the most vulnerable communities is regularly updated. Mm -hmm. Who should be responsible for that? Or is it all of us? Anyone want to try to answer that? Regular update of information. Right. Sandy? I, I think that we, okay. Pat, mm -hmm. That's Go fine ahead. if you want me to come. Yeah, okay. Um, I think that there should be a standing working group that has representatives of civil society, that has the appropriate government agency and private sector participants, if you will, that is uh, a situation room, a clearing house. And from this base, regular updates on information should go to all the major stakeholders. Uh, I, I think it should be a standing committee uh, because the roles that different uh, stakeholders, different kinds of people have to play are all so important. But having the necessary government agency collaborating with key civil society organizations in that area to have this base, I think will help. Yeah, I'm um, there. Just like the... I can. Um, Go uh, sorry, ahead. I'm just gonna jump in. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with what Professor, Professor Tommy is mm. saying. Uh, I also think, I mean, because the nature of the problems individuals or households face, and this is uh, you know important to keep in mind, something is very hard to observe by any central body, right? So that dynamism in response is really important. Um, and we've seen this in uh, in past uh, crises, whether they're health related or they're say, in other forms, you know, conflict or political or whatever. So the role of local bodies, uh, whether they're religious or the local um, administrative head or, or someone who's just respected um, in communicating what needs to happen given something that they've observed um, is essential. So, and then obviously communicating back what's happening to central bodies um, as well. So I think that that back and forth is really important. Uh, we, we need to recognize the most vulnerable populations is a really big and diverse and nuanced set of people, um, not just in any one country, but across countries. So yeah. uh, certainly keep that in mind. Um, I also wanted to address one other thing that um, is implicit to this conversation. I mean, is we've mostly talked about different mediums of, of engagement and the visual components are really, really important to see. Uh, we recently also wrote this brief on how to do this for populations that maybe cannot read. I mean, we're a text message and WhatsApp based institution, so how does our operation fit there? Um, and speaking to extreme poor populations as Professor Otomi did is, is essential, essential right now uh, as well because uh, whatever digital strategies we may employ, there is a different design and process that we need to approach uh, the populations with, um, however we may define them. But just want to emphasize that here as well. Yeah, um, uh, you brought that up and actually just as somebody asked the exact uh, question, uh, you know, our, our, a lot of our populations, predominantly illiterate populations, how are we reaching those people? Um, Sandy, did you have an, uh, a thought on that? Sorry, Nancy, on? On a predominant 
mostly illiterate communities, how would you uh, adapt your your approach, your campaign uh, to to reach a, a wider uneducated populations? I, my first one would be a radio. You know, it's firstly still one of the most uh, predominant medium in that community. Um, it has people that speak, you know, like what, one of the things we wanted to do was a partnership with the radio station for them to, we would give them the information, but they would translate it and communicate it in a way that their audiences were used to receive the information, right? So I think if we stick to the radio, they, so we would give them a media release, for example, in English, but the host translated it in, in Sichuan, which worked really, really well. You know, and I think that's where for me, uh, going back to basics, I think the one thing that this um, pandemic has taught me is that right now we need to go to the to the basics, like Professor was saying, use the people that the trusted sources and use the platforms that people trust. You know, and a radio for me remains that, especially in local communities. And, and then they don't even have to read anything, you know, they're just listening in and being taught. So that would be mine. Yeah. Okay. Um, in, uh, in fact, a uh, lead on question to that is, how have you measured uh, success so far with your campaign? Would you say that you've achieved your objectives? So depending on, we haven't changed behavior, but we have shared credible information. And one of the things, remember when I started, I said we wanted to calm the panic, right? Because the mind, is the source of, of money in that environment, right? So we needed everybody to be calm and know that the mine is going to open, you will still have your job, blah, 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 blah. I did a call when they came back, there was no use to that. And one of the things, and I asked them, how did they find the conditions of the, the lockdown conditions? And the response was, they were bearable because of the constant information that they received. It calmed them down, you know? So for me, that was my need to get process. closer to the mic. We didn't hear the last part. Yeah. So I was saying I did a poll and asked the employees on how they found the lockdown, right? And the the one of the guys said they it wasn't that bad because of the information that they were receiving. So the constant communication really, really worked. And that for me was our measurement of success because we wanted them to be calm. We wanted them to come back to work safe, you know? So, you know, that's it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Osman, the next question is for you. Uh, um, is Arifu responsible for getting the information to the end user? Or, or is it the partners? Um, if it's the partners, how does Arifu track and monitor the dissemination of the information? And how do users engage with the content? Yeah, this is, this is, a, this is a great question. Um, ultimately, it's Arifu that's responsible for disseminating the information, um, but I know that won't tackle the second component of this directly. Um, but users okay. engage through multiple platforms ultimately, right? So uh, as I briefly alluded to in the presentation, SMS is the sexiest app on any phone because it's on every phone. Um, and so that's one of the main nodes of communicating with end learners or audiences that as different partners may have. Um, certainly we've expanded to WhatsApp and Messenger and certain other platforms as well. It's important to have that uh, in, our uh, in our arsenal, so to speak. Um, so yeah, and we recognize that most will not have access to data. That's why the SMS component is there. And certainly the SMS cost uh, is actually borne by the partner in our relationship. So ultimately, this is a free service for end users um, who use our content. So they're not using USSD, which would uh, not cost. not typically. The primary uh, node is just uh, you can send a text called Arifu. If you're in Kenya, you can do this right now to two two seven four four, and you can get information immediately. And in your presentation, you said you know. So a lot of the information is going straight to SMEs. What have, what has the response been from SMEs? What are they telling you? Is the the is the information helpful? Has it helped them in yeah, any it, way to? Yeah, it's ahead. hard to say right now. We have 
we have good engagement levels with the with the content so far. So we're hopeful that, and let's say, as far as I can observe, it's higher than the average engagement of the usual content. So there's definitely demand. That is what I can say for sure right now. We are yet to conduct like follow-up uh, measurements of whether this is being used or applied well, or if it's actually helping them. Um, we've also complemented this COVID response strategy, which I didn't speak to right now, but you know there is a need. I think the Central Bank of Kenya also put out the fact that there's like 75% of SMEs see themselves as being at risk uh, of shutting down by the end of June. Right? Yeah. So um, there is a massive need for response there. Um, I mean, obviously, the situation might have evolved since then, but keeping in mind that we're also trying to figure out how to pair good information uh, and knowledge improvements with, say, cash relief programs, um, something that we're still stress testing with our partners at MasterCard and others. So uh, that's also happening. So there's multiple strategies here. So it's not just information, it's information paired with programs, paired with response, um, so that people have the most resource slash support and information that will help them make better decisions. So uh, that's what I would say to that, even though I know I wish I had a better response okay. to whether how people are adapting the information right now. No, it, it, it's uh, understandable. It's early, early days and sometimes you don't really see a lot of behavior change or, you know, you can't track um, results until maybe in another few months out. So um, thank you for that. Um, Professor Otomi, next question is for you. What was the initial response of the population in your area to safety measures in regards to the prevention of um, COVID-19 uh, spread? How, how, did, um, uh, how did these steps in, to ensure the safety measures were being strictly followed by um, large populations? How did the messaging messaging help? Right. Uh, first, I, I think that um, the the general orientation of many people was skepticism about the whole COVID nineteen thing. Uh, they were like, "Oh, this is not for Africans." These, all those kinds of uh, things kept going on. But the uh, consistency with which we tried to uh, communicate it to certain target groups. Uh, our philosophy is changing the world one person at a time. And so we, we try to be very deliberate with certain groups. And those groups we saw began to respond and we encouraged them uh, to, in fact, see it as a kind of a pyramid scheme. If you are influenced, call another five people, get those five people to call another five each and, and all of that. We thought that kind of one-on-one -on -one communication would be best yeah. to be effective, you know? So, uh, but we met a lot of uh, people who were very skeptical in the beginning. We saw the uh, conversion come along, but we hope that we, in the next week or two, we'll begin to get a chance to measure more directly the kinds of people who have come to some of the uh, programs that, that we have tried to set up in this regard. Great, I, I love the way you uh, compared it to a, a pyramid scheme. <laughs> Positive I didn't want to pyramid say Ponzi. scheme. I didn't want to say Ponzi scheme. <laughs> um, <laughs> I like that. Uh, another question for you, Professor, is, um, you know, your thought about post-COVID initiatives, how do you promote communities to continue practicing regular hand washing, et cetera, post-pandemic? I mean, I think everybody's saying that this, this, uh, this pandemic, this disease will be with us uh, for years. So how do we yeah. make sure, and, and maybe all of you have uh, some ideas around this, how do we make sure that, um, you know, this behavior is, is changed to the point where it becomes a habit Habits. and people aren't yeah. thinking about it too much anymore, but yeah, yeah, habits. Right, this, this is really uh, at the core of, yeah. This is really at the core of the concept of human solidarity networks, which is taking geographies, as I, I suggested, and bringing together various classes the people from the uh, uh, blighted neighborhood, 
and the people from the upmarket neighborhood, a few, maybe a few miles down the road, and the businesses around that general area, and getting them to identify specific things. The primary things we're focusing on are issues around the environment, uh, the drains, setting up uh, um, uh, uh, boreholes for water, washing places. So as you get into a neighborhood, there is a tap somewhere around. You can go and wash your hands. Organizing that is critical to the work of those human solidarity networks. And we hope that we can then institutionalize those and help people uh, to sustain them uh, as part of. But communication is also still important. You know, like the example I gave from San Francisco, that keeps gnawing at me. How do we make people not succumb to fear? Because the greatest damage from this pandemic has not been so much the direct heat, but the fear that it has generated in those who, I mean, I am told, you know, my wife is in the healthcare area, and yesterday night we were talking about this. Uh, a psychiatrist, psychoanalyst, uh, their hands are more than full right now because stress levels are so high, people are flipping. And I think that uh, it's an area to continue communication uh, 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 to ensure that we get people to adjust and become more balanced in the way they see the world. Thank you. Um, so we're six minutes past the hour. I just want to make sure that uh, everybody uh, who's on right now um, wants to uh, extend this a little bit longer. I want to open um, uh, open uh, mic session for anybody who wants to make a comment or uh, express uh, uh, an opinion. Um, we can maybe have uh, hands up for anybody who wants to, to make a comment. Um, and while, while uh, people are putting up their hands, I'd also like to remind people, please give us your ideas for uh, future webinars. We want to, uh, we're, we're now um, scaling back a little bit. It, the webinars won't be every Thursday, but every other Thursday, so twice a month. But we'd like to know from you, especially the ones who have reg been joining us on a regular basis, what you'd like to hear about, what topics um, partic in particular, which speakers you'd like to hear from, and we'll do our best to, to um, make it happen. Anybody in the audience want to make a comment or share an opinion, please uh, raise your hand and um, George will open your mic. Anyone? I think we can stay on the call for maybe another five, six minutes. Okay, while we wait uh, to see if anybody else has, um, anybody has anything to say, um, there's another question here. Um, this is again, open to, to anyone, uh, any of the speakers. How are we ensuring that information is persuasive? Even with correct information being disseminated, there's still a rampant disregard of the advice to wear masks and keep social distancing among vulnerable communities. Um, I, I know I see that every day and I don't even think it's only among vulnerable communities. You go yeah. into a store to do your shopping and people are just not, um, they're not wearing their masks properly, they're not keeping social distancing. How do we make information more persuasive? Um, Nancy, maybe uh, maybe as the as the speakers ponder over that question and, and uh, response, we have Sanjay in the audience who um, has a comment or I think has a, has something to say. Oh, go great. ahead, Sanjay. Great. Hello, uh, hello, everybody. Nancy, and a great great session that you're holding. I'm very happy that uh, this discussion has reached this level over there in Africa. Uh, even though your numbers are not too very large Great, globally. Welcome. I come, I call you from India. Uh, I am from Hyderabad. In fact, I have asked some of my teams in Africa through the Engineers Without Borders to also link up with this initiative 
as uh, Intellect Cap has been working with me over the last 10 years in rural communities as well as uh, skill development in a big way. I'm very happy to see that you guys are discussing and having this regular meeting. I just wanted to uh, share one uh, input at this stage. Uh, I think because Africa at the moment is in its very early stages of understanding the impact of uh, the coronavirus at the community level. So the ability and the capability that you develop across the nations in managing information as well as tracking information is extremely critical and has to get enabled at a government level. Now, is there any sort of an effort uh, that is already underway which can show you the current status across the continent or across the, maybe the most important uh, largely populated countries of Africa where there is some tracking of coronavirus and its impact? Because there is a lot of learning that has happened in India over the last few lockdowns and the wasteful activities that have been done by the government, which should not go waste and uh, should be understood properly by the African government before they blindly go and repeating the same mistakes. And uh, that is the reason I thought I would comment over here and inquire from all the learned speakers over here as to what is the current status of understanding of coronavirus as a as a so-called pandemic amongst the population and what are they really looking at from the point of view of solutions in the form of the right information reaching them and the activities that they could actually individually initiate at the youth level, at the people level, at the community level. Was I audible? I hope my question was heard. Yes, yes you were, you were. Yes, Fantastic. thank you very much. Who would like to who would like to uh, attempt to answer? Uh, it is more of a comment. There are no questions. answers. In fact, the answers will be with most of you. Maybe all of you are yeah. having some input, depending on which country is having the latest uh, summary over there in Africa. Yes. Well, I, I think uh, as one of our speakers said, yeah. initially a lot of people. Uh, you know, we're saying, oh, this is not a disease for Africa. Um, and then, uh, and then, uh, you know, as, as it became a little bit more of a reality, um, because we're not seeing the huge kind of uh, fatalities that Europe and America have experienced, uh, then people started spreading rumors and saying, oh, um, it's because of the weather here, we're not going to get that sick. Um, and, and even more, um, I think, important is the fact that a lot of people feel, uh, well, this is just another disease. If you think about the diseases, pe diseases people have to combat with every day, yeah. uh, from dysentery that, that so many children die from on a daily basis, malaria, cholera. Um, so to a large extent, I think, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the speakers could uh, may, may have other opinions, but to a large ex extent, the people I've spoken to, especially those who live in informal settlements, are feeling like life, you just have to move forward because disease will, diseases come and go. Then see, can I say something that might Please. come across as a little crude, you know? When we were, and, and I think that's where the challenge for us has been, in making this pandemic and first is the word pandemic like it's not a common you know like true we yeah, yeah. like so let's the, the, they're word. calling it a pandemic the COVID 19 the, the words are so big right <laughs> that we are talking over them mm -hmm. secondly the situation you know one of the ladies that you saw in that in one of my slides who was picking up that newspaper when we were handing them out she said are these for sale and we said, no, they are free. And she said, oh, because I need, thank goodness, because I need toilet paper. Do you understand? Now, do you get what I'm saying? The level of that, those, where the, the things that those people are worried about are not, and I get it, it's, it's a pandemic, it's killing people and stuff like that. But in their context, in their environment right now, this pandemic is one of many things that they're dealing with. You know, and when we start talking about changing yeah. behavior, we have to change, we have to communicate it with that in context. 
And again, be kind to the boss follows and everybody else in the thing that we are what, 60 days into the thing, you know? Everybody like it's too much. You know, even I now I'm like I communicate for a living, but I have stopped watching the news. I've stopped, I've cut down on what I'm I'm consuming because or else I'm going to go insane. Yeah. You know, and so we I think we need to take that into consideration when we're looking at the mass population and how we talk to them. Well, that's a very nice point you made, Gandhi. In fact, I, I wanted to actually corrob corroborate on that. That it seems, in fact, the same way India too started saying that this entire virus will disappear in the summer. And then when the real data started getting compared and sort of mortality rates that we saw. In fact, if I am given the chance of sharing some data analytics that we have across the world, um, if the screen can be shared, I would like to share that with you for your own understanding and see how the entire story has been tracking. Actually, to a very large extent, uh, the fear has been the larger problem in rather than the disease because there are many more people dying of things yeah. like heart, heart attacks, congestion, lung failures, and accidents even compared to coronavirus, where we, are, we in India are seeing yeah. a mortality of hardly 4% to 6%. In fact, at some particular stage, of course, there could also be a problem in the data collection that, I could, that, that you could see. But then you go back to the developed countries and see what is the mortality rate that they're ending up at. It is hardly 1 in 10 to 1 in, 1 in 15, which is nothing near a pandemic. Yeah. So my worry, my worry is that is, is this some sort of a deeper uh, confusion that is being created in the minds of the people of the world to put them in fear so that some other ulterior motives are taken care of. You know, this is something that all educated uh, Africans, as well as uh, I think I have, I can even see a few of the other Asians like Pakistanis on the group here who have questioned about the implication of religion and other things and all which are totally irrelevant for this entire uh, the, the, the sort of problem that is happening. They are basically playing upon the gullibility of the people in the absence of right information and the right action to take, which could be as simple as maybe having a steam, a steam inhalation on a daily basis to keep your nasal passages clear, along with a number of traditional messages, medicines that are available to you, rather than going in trying to find for find a vaccine which is non-existent and create a business for the Western world which actually is non-existent uh, or, or which is actually a sort of a a business which is created out of fear. You guys need to think about these sort of things. And maybe after the answers are over, I will quickly, for over two minutes, share some data that I might be having as it is relevant today, which might make more sense on this matter. And unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately, we 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 must stop. It's actually uh, we've gone over seventeen minutes. Okay. And okay. Um, although we, although we'd love to see your data. Maybe you could share I have it. shared the link. I have shared the link yeah, where the data is only put up on Facebook. You can have a look at the Yeah, data. share the link. Thank you so much. So let me uh, close off our session today. Wow, this has been great. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much to our speakers. Uh, as you can see, this is a subject that a lot of people are, are passionate about or want to really, you know, uh, understand. We're all grappling with this. How, how do we you know, how do we uh, really make sure that communication is effective and leads to behavior change? And if you think back during uh, the first few years when HIV AIDS had, you know, hit the world hard, um, they, we were kind of in the same space. Uh, and it took years and years and years of the same information always going out until, pe you know, people started changing their behavior um, slightly, some people have behavior, so it's not something that will uh, will stop tomorrow. Um, but thank you so much to everybody. Uh, we will be sending out um, links to uh, uh, to listen to the webinar if you want to hear it again or share it amongst your networks will send out a link after after our present uh, after our webinar today and i just wanted to bring everybody's attention before we uh, log off to uh, the united states africa development foundation they're one of our partners um, 
uh, one of uh, AVPA's largest uh, funders, actually. And uh, USADF um, are uh, keen to, to hear from uh, a lot more organizations, um, especially if you have you know, some great ideas about how to tackle this uh, particular um, pandemic, uh, although maybe we shouldn't be using the word pandemic anymore. Um, but yeah, we put up some information on that slide about USADF and um, just wanted to share that with you today. They're creating pathways to prosperity for underserved communities in Africa. And we thank them very much for being partners uh, around the, these uh, webinars, this webinar series. So on that note, I'd like to say goodbye. Thank you very much to everybody. Keep safe. Um, and please let us know who, what you'd like, to, uh, like us to address in the next uh, upcoming webinars. Thank you very much. Bye to everybody. Keep safe.